I'm Tom Edwards from ASAP Supplies, and we'll be doing a talk on diesel engine maintenance. Uh, there'll be, well, just a bit about myself. I sort of worked at ASAP for sort of the last 15 years since I've literally left school. It's like the worked way through the company. I'm not really saying we're not engineers. I mean, the business was started 27 years ago by an engineer, and a lot of the day to day business is solving problems, people ringing up with diesel engine problems, maybe problems of a water system, things like that. So we tend to sell the more sort of technical sort of products and that comes in hand in hand and having to know what we're talking about. The main focus on the talk today is to be on two areas of the diesel engine and that's to be the fuel system and the cooling water system. The reason we're focusing on them two areas is sort of just the stat of the RNLI website. In 2015, they were 1,217 times motorboats were in trouble in the UK, and the majority of them problems were based around the machinery issues. And speaking to some of the RNLI people, they said the most common reasons do evolve around the fuel and the cooling bit. So I thought it would be good to base it on there, and yeah, they're the two problem areas. So that's a typical diesel filtration system. I mean, there's more complicated versions than that, but that is pretty much the basis. So you go from the fuel tank through a pre-filter to take the bulk of the dirt and water out of the system, and then up to the lift pump on the engine, which would be there. And then that would go through a secondary filter to take the finer parts out, and then into the fuel injection pump, which then pressurizes it, and then that goes into the injectors. On a diesel engine, you then have a return line which runs back to the fuel on the, t the fuel tank. So it actually circulates the fuel all the way around. That's basically showing the same system, but showing each component. And what we're going to do in the presentation is go through each component in a bit more detail, things to look out for, things to do when servicing, and just general things like that, really. So to start off with, all diesel fuel systems start with diesel. So I thought it'd be worth just talking about that because it has changed recent or over the last few years. They have made a few changes to diesel, which sounds a bit strange, but it's not what it used to be. They now say from the refinery, actually, diesel only has a shelf life of about six to 12 months. After sort of 12 months, you actually start getting solid composites start forming in the diesel. It starts to discolor and all of that prevents it from burning so well. You also get Condensation is one of the worst in, in general boat and you've got a large fuel tank, you've got a large surface area, differences in temperatures re results in condensation forming up on the inside of the tank and then you get water drips down into the bottom of it. You also get exactly the same thing happens in the marina. So you've got a big storage tank with thousands of gallons inside it and if you're the unlucky boater who gets the last bit, quite often you get a good chunk of water in the fuel as well. Due to regulation changes, EN590 fuel, which is pretty much the fuel you get from a normal fuel station or anywhere like that, they're actually now putting 12% biodiesel in it. And biodiesel is hydrostropic, so it actually holds the water inside it, and it holds 30 times more than what normal diesel used to. So that Plus, you've got the extra issue that they want to take sulphur out. Sulphur is now seen as a bad thing and it gives off bad emissions, so they're reducing sulphur. The good thing about sulphur was that it used to work as a biocide, so it actually used to prevent growth within the fuel. Now they're taking that out, that's why we're seeing sales increase on biocides to try and compensate for that. Then, on top of all that, you've got new engines for them to meet their emission standards they're using what they call a common rail fuel injection system. On this engine, it's a very basic system, but on the newer ones, they're going up to ridiculously high pressures, and the tolerance they've got to work to is meaning that it's got a very, very clean fuel. Any particles of water or dirt could potentially blow out the injectors. So all that together is sort of making, yeah, you need to be more aware on the diesel system itself. So the first component, is a typical pre-filter. Some people call it a water separator. It's basically something like this, and it's designed, it's almost like a strainer. It's the first filter in the system, the diesel comes through, and it takes the large particles and the water out. 
There's lots of different options. they sort of changed over the years and depending on the horsepower of the engine, the age of the engine and things like that, determines on which one you'd like. So we start off at the most basic, a sedimenter. So this one is, we have got one here. It will generally look something like that. A glass bowl at the bottom and inside there is that cone looking part. Fuel comes in and it relies on the gravity forcing the water out of the fuel. It forms its droplets and it ends up in the bottom of the bowl. There's actually no service parts to take out on a yearly service. We would just recommend cleaning it out and obviously regularly checking on how much water's in the bottom there. You can just drain it out at the bottom there. Very straightforward. <laughs> does a job on older engines and that is ideal. An old engine, chug away with a bit of water in it and it'll let it go through. On the newer engines, you'd really need to be looking for something a bit more complicated. Second setup would be the agomalator. I don't think many people actually call it that, but I think that's the right term. So it's just a typical CAV fuel filter, CAV 296, or people call it Delphi 296, CAV type filters. That's just a paper element, the fuel comes in, the paper element takes the particles out and also the water, forced by gravity again, builds up in the bottom of the bowl. Different regulations, you can get them with see-through or glass bowls or metal bowls, depending on where you're doing the boat in, inland waterways, they always have to have a metal bowl, a pleasure boat going out to sea, you can have a see-through bowl so you can see what's going on. It's been the same setup for the last, I, I don't know how long, well before my time, but um, it does a job. Yeah, it's seen common on sort of the old Fornicroft engines and things like that. Then you get on to things like the Raycor spin-on filters. So Raycor elements are treated with what they call aquablock, so that actually is a treatment process that's been through to prevent any water from going through and then the water beads up on the surface of the element and coalesces, so it's basically like condensation on a window. The little particles join together, form a big particle, eventually it becomes heavier than the diesel and then falls to the bottom. That particular one has a primer, so when you come to priming the system back up, the little pump on the top, which I believe we've got one here, yep. You can pump up from there and then undo the bleed screw up on the lift pump and then bleed the air out. Slightly easier to, ser or easier to service, you've got a drain bung which you can undo with your hands to let the water out. Unlike, if you just go back slightly to this, I don't know, has many people serviced these before? Yeah? You've got a central bolt at the top. You undo that and then these parts are all individual, and then you've got an O-ring to join to the top layer. So you've got this part, and then an O-ring. You've got the glass bowl, and then an O-ring. The canister, and then the O-ring up there. So if you imagine you're trying to do that, you can put a bowl underneath, catch all the diesel, unscrew it, take it all apart, put the new element in, sandwich it all back up. Be very careful you haven't pinched an O-ring in the wrong way, because when you do it back up and then bleed it through, you're going to get a diesel leak and then do the bolt back up at the top. It's a lot easier said than done. With this, when it comes to servicing this, undo this bowl and the, or the element and the bowl. That comes off as one. You then throw away the element, put the new element on the existing bowl, fill this up with diesel, and then screw it back on. And then you should only lose the only air you should really get is what's in the top there and if any come out the fuel line. And then obviously this is where you pump it up and that will force the air back out the system. So it's quite a bit easier. The element is doing all the work. So it's doing the field, taking the water out and taking all the particles out. Unlike the turbine series, which has a two-stage filtration. So, there you go. With this, fuel comes in, and the turbine, the way the fuel is projected into the filter is at a slight angle, so it actually works as a slight vortex. That allows any large particles of water or dirt to come out straight away, and then it will go up and through 
an element like that, which would do the final filtration. To service it, it's got a few good little features. It's got the T-handle, so there's no tools required. Uh, yeah. So you'd undo your T-handle, take the lid and that off, and then you can pull out the element and put the new one back in. And see, it makes life easier as well because the ports are underneath the service point of the filter. So basically, when you come to undo it, you're not going to lose all the fuel in the system. If you have it ideally fitted below the level of your fuel tank, I know it's not always possible, but if you could do it like that, you can actually then use, if it did drop slightly, you can use the, uh, the bore valve on the fuel tank to then lift up the level again, and then you haven't got to prime it at all. Commonly, what we see is you've got a little ball inside. Well, if this is fitted above the fuel tank, when you come to undo the lid, the fuel still will try and go back into the fuel tank. If you've got the little check ball inside it, that actually lifts up and prevents it from happening. And then you can, because you will lose a slight amount, have a little tank or a little can of diesel, top this up from the top, screw the T-handle back on, no priming required. So you're seeing these are quite common nowadays, but you generally, sort of when you're going over 100 horsepower, really, probably because of price and things like that, really. Again, you've got different bowl configurations. You've got metal bowls, see-through bowls, and then, as in the picture there, You've got a metal tray underneath the bowl. That's for fire regulations. It basically passes a two and a half minute fire test to meet, comply with things like boat safety scheme and also some of the sort of commercial um, requirements you get. You also get the dual systems, also known as duplex. A fuel system is always, on a nice calm day, tends to work fine. When you're in a sea where it's very choppy, going up and down, because all the sediment and water has gone to the bottom of the tank, on a calm day it just sits there, it's no issue. It tends to be, when it's very choppy, it stirs it all up, and then that's what blocks up your filters. And then you've got to go down, your engine stopped, you've got to go down into the engine room and try and change over the filter, and then bleed, possibly prime the system again. Whilst if you go for a duplex or a dual system, you've either rake or do a simple valve and just turn over, or you can do it and plumb it up by having two single filters, possibly use the existing filter you've got and then put another backup filter. That's already one's in use, the other one is all primed, ready to go, just for that sort of emergency get you out of jail cut free card really. Then you go up to the fuel lift pump, mounted on the engine, driven by the engine, and that is what you use to, if you haven't got a primer on the filter, that is what you use to suck the fuel up from the tank. It tends to have a little manual bit on there as well, which you can sit, sort of prime up like that. And then you'll have a screw on there or a screw on the injector pump, which would then you can use to bleed once all the fuel comes through clear. You can then tighten it back up. It's not really much to go wrong with them, really. They do have a little diaphragm inside them, which is a moving part, so that is a wearing part. We, we do sell diaphragm kits for some of them quite often for the price of a diaphragm kit is close to the fuel lift pump itself. But yeah, that's job is really just to suck it up to that area. Then you've got the engine mounted filter. So on this, it needs to be serviced annually, at least annually. Basically the rake or filter or the cab filter which was fitted before does the bulk of it. This is just to do the final filtration. You tend to see filters tend to be listed by different micron sizes. The micron is the size of the particle that allows to go through the filter. You'll see on a prime, the pre-system, normally available in 2 micron, 10 micron or 30 micron, we tend to sell a lot more the 10 or the 30 microns because the 2, if you put a 2 micron in, you find that this isn't really, isn't really doing anything. So you tend to try and get the balance between the two. You want the pre-filter to take the water out and the large particles, and then this one, normally engines have got like a 5 micron or a 2 micron on them. So that I do that. But it's the engine manufacturers state what they need there, because that is what their engines need to run on. So whatever they recommend from the start, I'd recommend to keep it the same. If you had to put 100 micron down there, you'd find that this would block up too quick.
So all, that's, all the filtration system, this is what I was looking after, is the fuel injection system. So this is where it gets pressurised and then pushed into the injectors. Because of the emission standards nowadays, going back to the beginning of the talk, they use ridiculously high pressures and that's to actually get the fuel, fuel to come out as a very fine mist. If you think, if you've got an engine running at 2000 RPM, every turn is probably, if you've got a four cylinder engine, it's doing two sprays every resolution. And if you work out if that's burning 10 litres of fuel every 10 minutes or something, it's, um, oh, it needs to be so precise, that fine mist of spray. So that's the got to be able to deliver to that thing. If you get a bit of water or fuel go through, what will happen is on the injector points, it will actually scratch into the nozzle. And rather than getting a fine mist come out, you start getting droplets. And then it starts burning fuel incorrectly, and then the engine's not running how it should be. Some of the prices for new injectors, you're, you're talking thousands of pounds. So, yeah, it's worth looking after them. So that's pretty much on the fuel systems. And now we've got the engine cooling. That's just to show typical raw water cooled cooling system, indirect system or fresh water system, people call it. So you've got two separate circuits and it's separated by the heat exchanger. You've got the fresh water, where you put your antifreeze and cooling inhibitors, goes in at the top in the red system, and that's circulated one way by an engine um, circulation pump. And then you've got the raw water, which is sucked up from the sea, or river, depends where you are, through the heat exchanger, and then it dumps it out of the exhaust system. You also get direct cooled engines, pretty much pumped up water from the sea all the way through the engine and back out the exhaust. You don't really, you would never, I don't think you'd buy a new engine nowadays with direct cooled, but there used to be about, um, the problems with them was that you couldn't regulate the temperature of the engine as well, so you never got it to run at its optimum temperature. You also found that all the impurities you'd get from the sea would block up all the water galleys in the engine, you'd cause, have corrosion problems, and for that reason, well, the life expectancy wasn't really that great, so you didn't see them as much anymore. So we go through, same as we did on the fuel system, all the different components. First component, seacock. So seacock, be a ball valve or a gate valve. Tend to see a lot more ball valves nowadays, a few advantages of them, just a nice quarter turn, isolate it. You can have a vi visually look at it and straight away, okay, turn 90 degree, that's off, in line, that's in line, that's open. Um, didn't sell as many as impellers anymore because people can see if it's on or off because people used to start the engine up and burn the impeller. But <laughs> and then you've got the strainer basket inside the strainers, large particles in there get caught by the strainer, prevents you from clogging up all the system. I would recommend, if possible, Every time you go out for a trip, just check what's going on in that strainer basket. It's a very easy. Some of them are just a screw top. Some of them require a little socket set to undo them. But most of them have a see-through lid. So you can actually just visually see what's going inside there. The only other thing that sometimes get asked is, is it best to have just a normal straight-through um, skin fitting? It's just a hole coming out the bottom or go for one of the ones with the grills at the bottom to prevent any parts from getting sucked in. It's not a huge difference. Obviously, one of them, you prevent the large particles from coming in. Disadvantage, if you ever to suck up a plastic bag or something in the marina, you then can't get it out. Whilst with a normal skin fitting, you are able to, if the strain is above the water line, if you undo the top of the strainer, the water's not gonna come in, and then you can actually use something to rod out the plastic bag. That's about the two differences I got told, and I thought, yeah, that's quite a good point, actually. You then go to the raw water pump. It's a flexible impeller. The impeller sucks the water up and then pushes it through the system. Always driven from the engine. We've come across it before. People try to use an electric pump to do the job. It's not ideal. If you ever had your battery went flat or something like that, you were going to overheat your engine. So you want to drive it off a pulley, or mount it directly onto the engine. So as soon as the engine turns over, the pump's spinning. How it works, 
So driven by the engine. So you can see there, you've got the impeller spinning. It would be spinning clockwise. Inlet pump fills up. The, this top piece here is a cam and that compresses the impeller. You can get different thicknesses. You get half cams, quarter ca cams, full cams. The thickness of the cam, the thicker it is, the shorter impeller life you'd get, but then the more water it'll pump. So again, it's one of them. Engine manufacturers will do tests with the engine to determine which one's the best one to suit their engine. As the blade comes off, it then creates a vacuum, which then sucks the water in. Then each chamber in between the impellers fill up. You can see an impeller and sort of gives you an idea of what they are. And then when it gets to the other side, the opposite happens. The cam then compresses that chamber and then the water is forced up and it goes en route to the heat exchanger. So this is sort of typically parts inside the pump. So you can see in there you've got cams, wear plates that sits behind to prevent you wearing the pump. Mostly people just think of servicing a raw water pump, just replace the impeller. There is a few other things to keep an eye on. Because you've got the end cover, the wear plate and the cam. Because that impeller is in contact with all of them, they all become wearing parts. So if you've, got, if you've just bought a second hand bait or something, it is worth when you first do your first impeller change, just check. Just run your finger down and see if you can feel that groove. Sort of see on there, you can start to see where the rubber impeller starts wearing away on the brass. If that happens too much on the cam, the wear plate, and the end cover, what you'll find is that the pump can't self prime as well because it'll start moving water around in them pieces rather than trying to suck it up through the strainer. Okay, so you can see some warm parts there. Also, the cam, you'll find that the cam on the um, points there will get very sharp and then they'll start cutting into the impeller. You can see on the top. Your top right picture, you can see where it started cutting into there, so it started killing your impellers quicker. That should be quite, quite nice and smooth. Obviously, that also means that this thickness is decreased, so it's not pumping the amount of water it should. Impeller removal. So you tend to see, well, obviously shown by the, how the impeller wears the brass parts of the pump. You see people with screwdrivers trying to force it out, and what you tend to find is you get all marks around the top of the pump and it scratches all the brass. Obviously that impeller's spinning at say 1,000, 2,000 RPM. So if there's any marks in there, it's just gonna churn up the rubber. You really want it to be as nice and smooth as possible. So you get little impeller removal tools. So you've got little pincers, bite into the side of it. It's one of them things also when I'm up here, it looks really easy to do, but obviously picturing down in an engine room, you might not have hardly any space. And the, what, this shaft, you do that up, that then pushes down on the shaft and the pump, and then the exp impeller extracts. It's all, some people take their impellers out through the winter as well, when they're doing the winterization, because rather than having it compressed there all winter by the cam, when you go to start up again, the blades are actually be bent over. So if you pull the impeller out, you can, yeah, it sort of gives it a bit of time to come back out together. It's another little tip. On the end cover of the pumps, you tend to get the identification number. Um, you, you can't really see, but there's a number on there. It's worth making a note of that because some people turn the end cover around and then think, oh, I can get an extra life but then you've got no number, and then if you ring up a well, company like ourselves, it's very hard to identify which pump is fitted to that engine. So if you're gonna turn it around, make a note. So you go from the pump up to the heat exchangers. So you could have a heat exchange, manifold heat exchanger, so it's cooling the manifold, and it has a tube stack coming through the top, just a normal tubular heat exchanger, heat exchanger with header tanks on the top, and then you've got your oil coolers all work in the same principle. They basically have a tube stack inside them. You can see on here, so this is a manifold heat exchanger. So you have a tube stack run through there. It also cools the exhaust, the 
parts and then comes up through the um, through the exhaust system. Yeah, it's connected up to that bit. You can see there. So you've got the tube stack down the heat exchanger. So you've got your fresh water going through this part, and then it gets circulated around there. This one's actually an oil one, and then you've got your raw water from the sea coming through that side. If you're mounting an engine, make sure it runs in the opposite way. It's more efficient. If you run them both the same way, because you've got the same particles in contact with each other, so you didn't get the same heat transfer. If you are fitting something like that as a heat exchanger, you then need to have a header tank up above it to actually get the coolant in. And then you need to just run the engine up. We always just say run the engine for a few minutes. That should get any air locks out and then top it back up again. Sorry, just go that fit, you said about running in different ways. Like... Yeah, so bring your seawater in that way. So that's going through the pipes, that's coming in there, out there, and then do your oil or your coolant water through that way and out that side. So they cross over, they're not running with each other. That makes sense? You can see tube stacks there. That's obviously all the impurities and that from the salt water gives you an idea after years and years they start to clog up. What people tend to say is actually just an unwound coat hanger. Not that you get many coat hangers which are wire anymore, but just use them to rot it out. Something along that nature. Just be careful because the tubes, they are brass and you tend to get solder around this outside. So then just go take a bit of care and just rot them through. And then some people put them in a, like a kettle descaler, just do the thing and leave them in there overnight. If you notice impeller blades are snapped off your pump, it's more than likely it's going to be ended up in the front of the heat exchanger, so I get stuck in there. <coughs> Remove the end caps and just check that when you get back to port. Because what you'll find, it's fine when the engine's just slowly running, they sit at the bottom. But if you ever have to go full throttle, you can pick it up and then it'll cover up potentially sort of 30%, then you get overheating problems. And then you go put the temperature down again and it runs fine and it's like, oh, what's going on? And you know, one of them annoying problems. And it's also worth actually, something people get caught out quite a bit is of leaks and that, is that these rubber pieces, because that is what separates the fresh water and the raw water. Because you've got a tube stack in there and that's, the, that's basically sort of forms as a seal. So they do need to be replaced because the Jubilee clips, if they've been on for too long, that compression starts to go and then you start getting raw water and fresh water mixed together for the sake of sort of 10, 15 pounds, what they are, it's worth just keep an eye on that. The final part for the raw water job, this job is to go out through the exhaust system. So it's injected, goes through the tube stack, so you then get sort of tepid water to come out this end and it goes in and mixed with the exhaust gases and that allows you to use rubber hose and also reduces the noise of the exhaust system. You do, it does mean you've got hot salt water running through and a lot of these are sort of alloy or cast elbows and you get no end of problems you can see on this engine here it's been corroded and then you have to try and patch it up engine manufacturers are getting a bit better and they're using stainless steel elbows nowadays which are lasting longer but even stainless steel after a while they will corrode with hot salt water hot salt water just eats away at everything so just be careful because that is a real safety nightmare and people don't realise that if because if you've got a hole there, you then got exhaust gases in the bottom of the in the engine room coming up through the boat. So it's yeah. It's worth just having a poke around there to make sure there's not any holes forming. It's not really yeah, it's not worth risking it. So then they get an exhaust system, like I say, rubber hoses, you get plastic components, it's all because that water has cooled the exhaust gas down low enough so you can use them parts keeps the, the temperature down in the engine room and then you have like water locks which then work as a silencer but also when you switch the engine off you then end up with water and gas or water really sitting in one part of the exhaust system if you use a water lock it basically works as a bucket and keeps it all in a safe area because when the boat's sitting on the moorings rocking around if it was just in a piece of hose it could build up momentum and it goes back into the engine. So it's basically, that's, it's a, yeah, basically a bucket at the bottom and it bubbles away, reduces noise and works in that way. What's that called? A water lock? Water lock. Um, 
some people call them a Werner lift. I think that's an, that's an old brand name. That's it. You get lots of problems with water in diesel. You talk about condensation in the marine fuel tanks. Yeah. Why don't you get the same problem just with that on diesel going into cars? Because the fuel turns over quicker. In your car, you typically run out of you run your diesel through in about a month, less than that. But in a boat, if you've got three or four hundred liters of fuel, and then the fuel's just sitting in the tank for a whole season, that's when the condensation starts to build up. You also, in a marine environment, there's a lot more moisture in the environment. And then, plus on top of that, you've got the circ the return line going back into the tank, so the fuel gets warm. Then you've got a cold outside, and then that's where the condensation. Narrow boats really suffer badly with it because their fuel tanks tend to be built into the skin of the boat. So you've got the cold of the canal, then you've got the return line of the, um, from the engine warming the diesel up and then condensation forms. Yeah. Is there any virtue in filling a tank right to the top? That's what everyone always says to do. Yeah, that is the common thing. They started those questions become a bit of a grey answer because they put biodiesel and then with biodiesel you're more than likely going to have water in the tank. So, but I would still recommend fill the tanks right up to the top and use a good quality biocide. That biocide just kills everything. Going. Um, M68 is one we use. We've sort of used that for years and from the stats and that, yeah, it's one of the better ones. And is that with every refuel? Yep. Yeah, it's sort of £25, and I think as a preventative, it cures about 2,000 litres of fuel. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Cheers.